All right. Um, so we're moving on to a new section of the course where things get a little bit more applied. You know, before you can implement some of the problem solving strategies in hydrology, you have to know the background information. And that's what we've been doing so far is a little bit of application with um, StormCAD and HY8, but then also quite a lot of fundamental information having to do with interception and um, rainfall and evaporation and so on. So um, if we look at what's coming up, for those of you who are in the Environmental Engineering 670, uh, your first submission for the project is due on Wednesday. And uh, you can email that to me by 5 p.m. on Wednesday. That's related to the, uh, the research paper that you're doing. And those of you who are in CE 433 don't have to worry about that. There's no project. It's just uh, the graduate students who have the extra, the extra work. Uh, but both of you have a new homework assignment that's posted now on Blackboard. Homework 6 is due Wednesday two weeks from this week. So you've got nine days for that assignment. It's due on the 2nd of March. So any questions related to the announcements? All right, so if you're following along with the reading, we're going to be moving into chapter eight now. And um, I think I've showed you this depiction before of a watershed. And um, remember that what defines a watershed is elevation boundaries that govern the direction of water movement. So when there's rain falling out of the sky, there's a certain spot on the hillside here at the top of the ridge line where if raindrops fall to the left of that line, they'll flow one direction. And if the raindrops fall to the right of that high point in elevation, then they flow the opposite direction. And so when we have a certain location we're interested in, and sometimes in modeling that's called an outlet location, if we had a location of interest, then all of the area upstream of that spot that to, contributes to flow, that's what we call the watershed. So here, there's several watersheds nestled within one larger watershed. If we see how this stream branches, you can see that there's one branch that goes off to the right relatively soon. There's another branch that, again, itself branches. And so, you know, depending on perspective, you could say that this little segment is the watershed that you're interested in. And that would be the watershed of interest if you had a road crossing. Let me see. How do you do the laser point? Is, is it control L? Yeah. If you had a road crossing this stream, then your watershed of interest would be much smaller than if your crossing location is here. If you have a, ro a road crossing this stream, then you'd need to know what's all of the area that contributes to flow at that location. And so what we're going to be focusing on is modeling to try and predict what is going to be the runoff hydrograph during a certain storm. And a hydrograph is just simply an expression of the flow rate versus time. And on a large scale, there's a lot of things that we have to keep track of to model the runoff. Um, if we're looking at a watershed scale, this is a model that says that the watershed flow, so the water that's coming out of this watershed, starts with the precipitation, PR. If there's any flow coming in through a stream up, uh, upstream, um, sometimes there, there could potentially be like a river going through a uh, ridge. And, uh, and then there's additional flow coming from the watershed surrounding a location. So this is the, the mass balance approach of saying, basically, water isn't going to be created in the watershed. And so we want to keep track of the flow in and the flow out, uh, how much evaporation there is, and how much infiltration there is. So each one of these terms is just assessing the quantity of water um, at a different stage or being gained or lost by this watershed by a, a separate process. Um, so the outflow, the amount of water that's in this stream, begins with the flow that's coming in 
through exterior regions, the precipitation amount, so those are both positive, and the more precipitation you have, obviously, the larger the outflow rate is going to be. Or if you have a big river feeding into a certain segment of your watershed, then that's also going to contribute to the outflow. But then each one of these other terms generally reduce the amount of outflow that would come from a watershed. Although there are a couple of exceptions where, for example, you can see here for groundwater recharge that it's possible that during dry times there may be um, spots where groundwater is coming out of a hillside that uh, had infiltrated into the soil earlier. So over the long term, there will be not a net accumulation or decrease in groundwater recharge. But depending on what your time scale is, it could be that during when it's raining, the, some of the water is going down through infiltration and recharging the groundwater. But then during a dry period, um, you maybe have, if you walk around, hike through West Virginia, there's spots of the trails that I go on that are soggy year round and it's just simply because of the the slopes and having high hillsides nearby and you know clay layers that kind of trap the movement of the water and then the clay layers stop at a certain spot and then there's been all this pressure built up in the soil behind that location so there's these permanently soggy areas there's one of those at Barbersville Park if you know where the tennis courts are at Barbersville Park if you go up the hill by those tennis courts you'll definitely get soggy shoes regardless of how dry it's been. Just It's perpetually moist there. Um, surface water recharge, there could be ponds that fluctuate in depth over time. And so that's why it could potentially be a plus or a minus is that um, in the short term, you maybe would fill a pond during rainy weather, but then it's possible that when the storm stops that the pond is continuing to release flow um, after the storm event. So this is just kind of a, a long-term model for trying to predict how much water could come out of this watershed. And I applied this model a few years back at the behest of the Department of Environmental Protection because they were interested in trying to estimate how much water could be extracted from a watershed uh, for large quantity users. And that is, um, you know, there are things like power plants and chemical plants and steel production facilities that use water for cooling. That uh, they're not actually putting it into the product, it's just that they have to dispel of heat and they use surface water to do that. And so there's regulations that say a certain amount of water has to stay in a stream to protect the native species there, to provide uh, for the aquatic life and the fish and so on. and so. We did an analysis of a watershed in the central part of the state just to figure out if you look back through 30 or 40 years of stream flow um, data, um, how much water could be reliably extracted without going below those minimum limits. So this is a, a large scale hydrologic model, but we'll usually not apply this approach the way that this is expressed. We'll, have empirical methods for accounting for some of these same factors, like the surface uh, storage water recharge. Um, we'll have those built into the models when we get into HEC-1 modeling and something called TR-55. There's a lot of exciting things ahead that take some of these concepts into, uh, into account. One of the things that reduces the outflow that comes from a watershed are abstractions. And um, I think I've used this phrase before, rainfall excess. And it's, first of all, important to differentiate between rainfall and rainfall excess, or precipitation and precipitation excess. Um, precipitation is what comes from the sky. And then the excess is what's left over after certain abstractions have been satisfied. And here I've got a picture of some surfaces that have become wet from rain. You can see here's a puddle. Uh, here's just wet asphalt. Uh, it looks like the puddle has fallen onto a relatively smooth uh, paving tiles, whereas you can see there's texture to the asphalt there. And um, even though the asphalt itself has a high C value, 
just because of the irregularity of the surface, it absorbs a lot of water at the surface. The water, even though if it's not seeping down through the asphalt or concrete, it takes a fair amount of moisture to wet the surface before water could flow over that surface. So abstractions are, one way to look at it is the difference, it's what has to be satisfied before you can begin to see rainfall excess. And rainfall excess is synonymous with runoff. That's just um, rainfall excess is usually measured in units of length because you know precipitation, storms, we, we talk about how many inches of rainfall there is or how many centimeters and so rainfall excess usually has those same units of length whereas runoff we generally will start to uh, think about it in terms of time and so it would be a flow rate or volume per time. So let's talk about some of these abstractions that reduce the amount of water that's available to run off simply because of surface wetting, for example, and there are some other factors as well. They can cause delay, and remember that delay is very valuable to us when we're trying to overcome the effects of urbanization. Um, urbanization is the process of disturbing soils and increasing the amount of impervious area and all of those things that are associated with urbanization are going to make the peak storm have a, a much faster arrival time at the receiving bodies and it's going to increase the amount of runoff because of the increase in impervious surfaces. So abstractions are good for us because it's causing that delay effect where it takes a few minutes of rain onto the surface before the water starts to run off. Now, there's going to be less of a delay from this asphalt than compared to like maybe the grass field that was there before the asphalt, but all things being equal, the asphalt that's rough and irregular is going to have a little bit more delay than a smooth surface. So we just have to account for the differences in travel time and quantity reduction from different types of surfaces, like a polished, smooth tile surface compared to a rough, irregular asphalt, or the natural, grassy surfaces and leaf litter that was maybe um, covering the surface before it was developed. So the reason why it matters, this delay, is that it's going to reduce the intensity of the runoff by number one, reducing the intensity of the rainfall that applies. And remember that when we use the rational method, Q equals CIA, we have to pick a time to figure out what intensity to use. If you're using an intensity duration frequency curve, you can't find out the rainfall intensity without knowing what time applies on that curve. And so the time is going to have to take into account these abstraction delays and it's also going to reduce the intensity because the water that's permanently bound to that irregular surface isn't going to be part of what runs off and goes towards the outlet. So things like detention ponds, things like sizing the, um, the geometry of a stormwater storm conveyance channel or um, a storm sewer, the sizing of those is affected by abstractions. And uh, sometimes if we have treatment to improve the quality of the water that's running off, that's also going to be affected. If we have to use aeration or grit removal to try and purify and clean up the water before it's discharged into a, a stream, then the amount of water that's coming into those treatment facilities would be reduced by the abstractions. All right. This is a photo uh, to illustrate the point that one of the abstraction types that can occur is this process of a rainstorm that comes into contact with buildings. And so if you have a little bit of rain and a little bit of wind, then the rain would be falling at an angle rather than coming straight down from the sky. And so densely packed urban areas that have lots of high-rise high structures um, can actually have an effect on the quantity of water that makes it to the ground. Like think about the shielding effect that this building would have if the rain was coming at an angle there's going to be a dry patch behind each one of these buildings. 
And there are plenty of cities that are tightly packed enough that this has a significant effect on the, uh, on the quantity of water that makes it to the ground surface. And that's because ordinarily uh, the water that's flowing down the side of this building is going to be trapped by a drainage network at the base of the building and it may be temporarily stored if they have regulations in place like we have here in Huntington that the first inch of precipitation has to be stored locally before it's discharged. So this effect is called interception. And uh, interception can be um, human-made obstacles like buildings, or it could also be vegetation, where um, you can see here the illustration is just that there's a leaf shape that's between the sky and the ground. And so any raindrop that wants to go from the sky to the ground but is blocked by this leaf, it may be temporarily delayed is all, where um, you know, it does eventually get down to the ground, or it could reduce the overall quantity entirely if the leaf uh, permanently traps this drop of water and it doesn't get to the ground surface and then it evaporates from the leaf or if it uh, absorbs down into the, uh, into the plant material itself. So interception has a delay and a reduction in quantity effect that we want to be able to account for. Um, a few years ago, I got interested in the effects of seasonal variation of interception. And uh, we're at the point of the year right now here in West Virginia where, you know, the woods kind of look like this. They're, they're barren, um, and there still is a, an interception effect when the woods are bare like this because you know, if you look down from above, a certain fraction of the area is blocked by branches and maybe you know this effect if you're a hunter and you're sitting up in a tree, you think you've got a clear shot to the deer until you look through the scope and there's just a bunch of branches in the way. So, um, you know, looking down from above, it's the same effect. A certain fraction of the raindrops may get to the ground surface, but some of them are gonna hit the, uh, the twigs and run down the, um, the trunk of the tree rather than being able to fall directly. So during the winter time, there is a little bit of interception, but during the summer time, there's a lot more. So this is that same location, but now completely leafed out in the summertime. So I got interested in trying to quantify directly the effects of interception and how that may vary through the seasons. And so I set out a rain gauge, um, both in an open area and under the tree canopy throughout um, about an entire year and I measured how did the rainfall patterns under the tree canopy change and trying to relate that to variations in lag time. Lag time is similar to time of concentration and we'll talk about that in more detail later but I wanted to find out basically if you compare a storm during the winter time and you can see I was measuring the, the rainfall in four different spots. I was measuring it in some open areas and then a few hundred yards away uh, under tree canopy. So there wasn't going to be any rainfall variation because it's not like these two sites were miles and miles apart. They were relatively close and there wouldn't be variation just based on how far apart they are, but there would be variation because two of the rain gauges I had set up under some trees uh, it was m like a mixed deciduous hardwood and two of the rain gauges I had in an open area that was far enough away from any buildings that it would be completely just a pure representation of the rain falling out of the sky. And so for this particular storm uh, that was in December, there was about eight tenths of an inch of rain. So that's a fair amount. You know, it's not big in the scheme of like a 25-year storm that would maybe be three or four inches, but I didn't have 25 years to gather the data. I had a season or maybe a year to gather the data. So I was happy with the storm of this size because it was enough to illustrate the effect that even for a relatively small storm with a bare canopy, the amount was reduced by about 9% and there was a delay of 30 minutes. And what I mean by delay is just how long did it take take to get the same quantity of precipitation. So here you can see seven tenths of an inch 
was achieved after the storm started. I measured the amount of time it took to get to 7 tenths of an inch. And then how long did it take under the tree canopy to get to that same rainfall depth? And so it was delayed by 30 minutes, taking into account the average performance between the two open areas and the two areas under the trees. So quantifying that bare canopy to what happened with the leafed out canopy, a much larger reduction in the amount during a certain period of time. So that's one way of looking at it is, you know, from the start of the storm till a certain period, how much has the amount been de uh, reduced? 32% versus nine. So we've effectively more than tripled the reduction in the amount of rainfall for this storm in June. And then the delay was longer. So, I mean, it makes sense with what we would expect that if you have more leaf area in the way, it's gonna reduce how quickly the raindrops get to the ground. But this kind of put some numbers to it. This was a direct measurement for the conditions here in West Virginia. And of course, there's published data that tries to characterize the same thing. That's what this table in your book gets at. Um, but this is gathered across the entire country for uh, essentially um, individual species of trees, not in um, a mixed hardwood woods like we have in West Virginia where you've got some pine, some maple, some oak, a lot of oak, um, and so on, hickory and so on. But um, what this table from your book is mentioning is kind of uh, in certain cases just year round if the trees don't vary much, if they're evergreen trees that don't have a lot of variation, it would just have a year round percent interception. Uh, and then in the case of other types of trees, they do show the variation between the summer interception and the winter interception. So it's just what percent of the rain is being intercepted and delayed. And um, of course, this varies based on the storm characteristics. And you may remember back to the table of C values. Let me just to jog your memory, let's see if we can get back to that table of C values because there's a similar effect that isn't being accounted for in this table that I think kind of should be accounted for. But I mean, you can't, there we go. You can't address every variable sometimes. All right, so this is the table of C values. And what this showed is that the bigger the storm, the higher the C value, meaning that the ratio between what runs off and the rainfall amount is closer together for the bigger storm. So you're overwhelming the capacity of the surface to either infiltrate or temporarily store the water in the case of asphalt and concrete. So here notice that basically the ratio between runoff and precipitation amount varied for the storm depth. Well, that table of interception that we were just looking at doesn't account for that. It was just a percentage that isn't actually accounting for the size of the storm. So that's one weakness of published data like this is it may be claiming to have seasonal variation, although you know it doesn't say anything about spring or the fall when there's some leaves on the trees and some leaves not on the trees. Where is that? Here? Yeah. yeah, so you'll notice that one of these was published in 81, one was published in 74, and it was probably different locations where they were studying it. I don't know what Pinus radiata is. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what kind of pine tree that is. But um, yeah, the, uh, the measurement methods could be a part of it. It could be that they're looking at different size trees like a mature forest versus a smaller forest. And if you're really trying to have a clear grasp on how much runoff there's going to be, every one of these variables is important. And so in the case of um, storm size, there may be that 500-year storm that has much less interception than a two-year storm. 
And there are some cases when it, it's just raining lightly that it will stay dry under a tree completely. You know, even a few minutes into the storm, you can stand under the tree and stay completely dry. But that's not every storm. You've probably had an experience where there's a, a tree that maybe you stood under it under one storm and you stayed dry, but then when there's a heavier rainstorm, it overwhelms the capacity for that vegetation to intercept the precipitation and then you end up getting wet. So um, this is pretty crude approximation. Um, the local climate conditions can also affect um, how much interception. And the, you know, the oak tree in California that has really arid conditions may have different interception than an oak tree in West Virginia where we have really high humidity. And so it seems strange that you would have arid conditions when it's raining, but that is the case. You know, Just because it's raining doesn't mean that all of the air uh, beneath the cloud layer is saturated with moisture. So on California, Utah, Nevada, um, even when it's raining, it can be relatively low humidity, all of the air surrounding that precipitation. And so the water can dry really quickly off of the tree during the rainstorm event. It's just uh, up aloft that the, uh, the moisture is fully saturating the air. Density of vegetation. There's some uh, pretty pathetic looking pine trees by where I live. They just haven't found the right soil, so they're just kind of patchy and wilted and barely hanging on compared to, you know, there are some locations where you may have a completely healthy tree that's going to have a lot more um, ability to intercept the rainfall. So the health of the vegetation is related to the density. So here is a formula that um, is a way to get a little bit more precise than just a percent reduction. Uh, what this tries to do is it does try to take into account the size of the rainfall, the, the, the intensity of the storm, storm, so to speak. So rather than saying, you know, you'd have 48% interception regardless of if it's a two-year storm or a 25-year storm. This alternate approach takes into account factors like the evaporation rate during the storm. So you can see here the secondary term is taking into account the evaporation. Um, and also taking into account the quality of the, uh, of the vegetation, the, the density of it, maybe the health of the trees, all of those things could be expressed in what's known as a leaf area index. And the, uh, the leaf area index is a ratio of the leaf area to the projected ground area. And what I mean by that is, you know, this is a side view of a tree, like a really crude approximation of a tree, all right? So if, if the rain is coming down from above, there is a certain area beneath that tree that is projecting um, like the, the shadow. If the sun was from above, that would be the shadow of the tree. But the number of layers, you could calculate the ratio in the area of the leaves to the area at the ground that is uh, projected by that tree. So that's what the leaf area index is, is it's kind of how many layers of leaf are there from between the sky and the ground. Um, so this is a pretty interesting model because it takes into account the, uh, the characteristics of the vegetation itself. So the storage quantity is kind of this factor is similar to the percent interception. But then it goes a bit further because it's taking into account the, the rainfall amount, the health of the vegetation, and then also the effects of evaporation during the storm. All right. So I'd like you to get some quick experience trying out this approach. If we have a storm that lasts 1.5 hours, and we know that there's going to be 3.8 centimeters of precipitation during that storm, and we also know the rate of evaporation during the storm, 0.3 millimeters per hour, then uh, we're going to do an example here with a spruce tree that has a leaf area index of 6.5. So it being spruce tells us its storage depth. And we can combine that with the leaf area index. 
So that is the K value to account for the uh, evaporation rate. So of this 3.8 centimeters of precipitation, what we want to do is try and find out how much of it is left over. So the, uh, the interception is going to reduce the precipitation amount, and so then the leftover amount afterwards, the excess, is what goes towards runoff and infiltration. Okay, um, so we're substituting in the, the S value of seven millimeters. And you can see here on the whiteboard that we've got an exponential function that when we make that substitution, it's not reducing the, uh, the storage amount by very much. You know, 6.969 millimeters. So this is the, uh, the storage onto the tree. And then there's a certain quantity of water that's going to evaporate from the tree during the storm event. And so the infiltration, excuse me, not infiltration, the interception quantity is 9.89 millimeters. So if there was 38 millimeters of precipitation, then what actually hits the ground is going to be 28.1 millimeters. So some of that 28.1 will infiltrate, and whatever doesn't infiltrate or is permanently stored as like puddles or surface wetting, then that will run off. So sometimes the, the book uses the phrase as after the abstractions are satisfied. And so the water that's falling out of the sky, some of it has to wet the leaves, some of it will evaporate from the leaves. Some of it has to wet the surface. Some of it has to infiltrate underground. So all of those other places the water ha can or needs to go have to be satisfied before then there's enough water for the, uh, the excess to begin running off. So 28.1 millimeters is uh, how much is available for runoff and infiltration. Any questions about this example? Depression storage is uh, separate from interception because there can be some accumulation of water in depressions that doesn't immediately infiltrate into the soil, and it also doesn't run off. It could be because the surface is flat. Um, it could be because there is an impervious surface or because um, maybe the soil's been disturbed or it could be relatively low hydraulic conductivity soil. But it's just uh, because of the topography there, there's no connecting channel to convey it towards the outlet. So depression storage is just another abstraction possibility. Is water being stored in puddles like this and it doesn't actually go anywhere, but they all have to be satisfied before the water begins to run over the surface. Um, in airports, a lot of water can be bound at the surface of the pavement because they've got this issue of needing relatively flat taxiing 
uh, surfaces and relatively flat runways, but then at the same time wanting to have just a slight amount of curvature there so that puddles don't form and the, um, you know, the water doesn't get too deep because then that could reduce the traction of the, of the wheels and cause safety concerns. Um, there have been a variety of studies that try to estimate the, uh, the depth of storage and the, the quantity of the abstraction that has to be satisfied for a variety of surfaces. And you can see that uh, for steep pavements, a couple of different references over the years have estimated that a steep pavement would store about 0.5 millimeters of water, whereas when it's flat, it could be between 1.5 or 3.5 millimeters of storage. So just a variety of different types of, uh, of surfaces. And I've referred to leaf litter or forest litter on several different occasions. And, and you can see why it's significant is that uh, 7.6 millimeters of storage compared to if you have a pavement that's maybe only taking 1.5 or at most 3.5 millimeters of storage. So there's um, a reduction in the, uh, the storage capacity of the surface and then probably the even bigger difference would be in the delay because of the uh, circuitous route that water would have to flow through a leaf litter structure compared to just the, the relatively direct and easy flow path it has for a flat surface. Um, the, the pavement here is expressed in terms of differences in slope, but the leaf litter isn't. You can see here that they're not differentiating between leaf litter on a hillside or leaf litter on a, uh, on a flat surface. So, you know, what would we use? We just use whatever we have. So we'd use this forest litter of 7.6 and, and apply it across all the categories, but then just know that if we had relatively um, steep slopes that it could reduce the depression storage quantity because that's that was the trend that we saw in the case of pavement is that if there's more of a capacity for sideward movement then it may not store as much in the surface itself um, <clears throat> this last bullet point here I want to explain a little bit and um, there are certain parts of our book that use the phrase antecedent moisture condition and it's abbreviated AMC in those spots. The antecedent moisture condition just means, um, is there water left over from previous storm events? And so um, if you have back-to-back -back rainstorms and the, uh, the trees are already wet from the previous rainstorm, then their ability to intercept is going to be reduced. And the same thing is true for depression storage, that if you have a lawn that's already soggy and satisfied and all the abstractions have been filled up from a storm on a previous day, then you're not going to get that same depression storage in a subsequent rainstorm before everything else is dried out, evaporated, infiltrated. So you have to be mindful of when you're designing the worst case scenario, really what is the worst case scenario? So it may be that you have a 25 year storm after a two-year storm. And a two-year storm would be all it takes to um, satisfy all of the abstractions and fill up uh, the storage capacity of depressions. And so, um, you know, when you ask yourself, um, what's your appetite for failure in hydraulic and hydrologic systems, you have to look at the probability of sequential events and not just events in isolation. It's pretty common to have big storms right after small storms. And when that's the case, all of these abstractions are going to be diminished in their capacity to mitigate um, runoff. All right, so that's all I have for you today. Let's take a look here at these announcements that uh, for those of you who are graduate students taking the Environmental Engineering 670, the first part of your project assignment is due Wednesday by 5 o'clock. And you'll, you should submit that by email. And then uh, for the rest of you, homework six is posted now. You can get an early start on that if you like. It's due Wednesday the 2nd. So that's it. Have a good day. <clears throat>